So, um, so yes, no, no, so we, I'm, I'm here, you have Marion Boisseau-Sierra, an university lecturer in accounting at Cambridge Judge Business School. And we've been teaching um, and looking together at accounting with MPhil um, and management students. During this term, we learn to read financial statements from corporation and evaluate them critically. However, today we're going to look at other entities, public sector entities, and it's really my pleasure to introduce you to our two guest speaker, Professor James Chan and Dr. Um, Jens Helling. So Professor Chan um, is joining us from Chicago in the US and he's Professor Emeritus at, uh, of Accounting at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So he held visiting appointment numerous ones in the US, in China, and in Europe. Chinese by birth, uh, Chinese by birth and American by choice, uh, Professor Chan is a renowned specialist in governmental accounting. His research focuses on the integration of fiscal budgeting, accounting, and statistics. He gained also practical experience through consulting with the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and American and Chinese governments. Uh, Professor Chan is a co-founder of the Comparative International Government Accounting Research Network, the CIGAR Network, very valuable for academics as, as us. And uh, Professor Chan is also a fantastic mentor to junior faculty and to prof practitioners in the public sector area. So I met, for example, Professor Chan in Norway five, six years ago, and he came to Europe then to train PhD students in public sector accounting. And I can't really say that I probably won't be here in Cambridge um, if I didn't go, you know, and attend this, these lectures in Boudou in Norway and met there Professor Chan. And it, it's probably the same for Jens, and this leads me to present you to Jens. Uh, Professor Chan's also played a big impact in, on the professional career of, 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 of Jens. So it's, Jens started his public sector accounting journey by undertaking a PhD in Germany, in, in Mannheim. And, um, and he investigated then the accounting practices of higher education institution in Germany and in the US. And then during his PhD, he visited Professor Chan in Chicago. So a few years down the road, uh, Dr. Um, Jens Helling is currently senior manager at EY and he has now over 15 experience, uh, years of experience in public sector accounting with a special focus on the IPSAT, the International Public Sector Accounting Standards, and also the EPSAS, the European Public Sector Accounting St Standards. So he's joining us from Stuttgart where he works um, at EY. And he has had the opportunity as a consultant to serve a number of international and national public institutions such as uh, public administration, higher education institution, and uh, health care in the healthcare sector. So J Jens also recently published a paper named Time to Rethink Public Sector Accounting Education uh, Practitioner Perspective. So he's keen on, um, on, on looking at education uh, of public sector accounting. I would also like to present you to a third person who's not there with us in person. Um, it's Sir Richard Stone. So <laughs> he's, uh, he, he's not with us in person. He passed away in, in 1991. So he was an eminent Cambridge researcher and the first accounting uh, professor in Cambridge. So he's sometimes known as the father of national ac income accounting. And in 1984, he received the Nobel Prize in Economics for developing an accounting model that would really track economic activities at a national and then international level. So Cambridge really has a special link to public sector accounting. And it's with this note that I wanna really uh, uh, start the lecture, uh, give the, 
and the 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 uh, yeah give give uh, James and Jens the the really the the chance to introduce um, us to public sector accounting. Thank you for being with us, and and the floor is now yours. May I begin? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, this is uh, James Chen uh, joining you from Chicago. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and also for the welcome. Since Marian uh, uh, brought up uh, Richard Stone as the father of uh, national income accounting, uh, I'm going to uh, bring in uh, a living person who may be called the father of the new kind of government accounting. And that's him. Does anybody know him? I know Yang Hailing does. Uh, his name is Charles Bauscher. He's almost 90 years old. In 1973, he led the team of uh, auditors, uh, CPAs, from the accounting firm of Arthur Anderson to prepare the very first set of uh, consolidated financial statements free of charge for the United States government. Now, that's 1973. And later on, uh, you'll see the uh, historical significance uh, of that. Well, I'm delighted to join you uh, today to talk about government accounting. I've been studying as well as teaching government accounting for 45 years. That's uh, almost half of a century. But there's a personal irony to that because for my three degrees in accounting, I took all the courses in business accounting and no course in government accounting at all. So I got so bored with business accounting that uh, after my PhD in 75, I decided to try something more exciting and uh, more important. Well, government accounting is more exciting because it combines politics with money, political power with money. It is also more important because it deals with people's money, with the people's money, taxpayers' money. And it's important because the, now the amounts are so huge. You're not just talking about millions, but billions. And trillions, as we'll see just a little bit uh, later. So I spent a lot of time mixing accounting with uh, political science, with economics, with uh, public budgeting, with macroeconomics and so forth. But in the meantime, some people in certain countries in the West thought, and they still think, that government accounting should be more like business accounting. And they even succeeded in pushing accounting standards, the accounting practice in that uh, direction. So since this is uh, probably the first exposure to government accounting for uh, uh, most of you, uh, we have an obligation to show you the state of the art, and that is, the new fashion in government accounting today is to be like business accounting. But that's not always the way it was uh, in Western countries, and still it's not the case in most countries uh, in the world. So the old fashioned traditional accounting still persists. And the reason is why? What is it? You know, isn't the convergence with uh, business accounting for the better. So Yang Haileng and I will try to answer these uh, rhetorical questions. And toward the end of the lecture, you will also have a chance to play international consultant. So listen carefully, for the students anyway, so that you will be able to justify your advice to your clients. And we hope that some of you will 
spent at least a part of their career in government accounting, and we hope that uh, this lecture will be your best preparation for your first uh, uh, job interview. So what is new government accounting? The essence of new accounting is that uh, it has two key features to it. One is accrual measurement, and the other one is the consolidated format of a financial uh, accounting. But government being government, it's necessary to adapt and not just adopt the business accounting standards and practices. Uh, take the accounting equation, uh, for example. Uh, uh, you'll see that it's exactly the same as you learn in, uh, in business accounting, except that uh, instead of using owner's equity, we use the term net assets. So why don't we do that? There's certainly some kind of ownership in the public sector. And also, when you look at the assets uh, in business firms, you have well-defined property rights. But for governments of a sovereign state, what does property mean? What does public property uh, mean? And turning to the liability side, corporations are limited liabilities, uh, corporations. But does the concept of limited liability apply to government or not? Uh, and uh, a business is allowed uh, to claim revenue until it has uh, provided services or sold a good. So can we use that particular criterion to recognize government uh, revenue or not? So uh, these are rhetorical questions. Uh, suggest that uh, it may be naive for government to simply imitate a business accounting, even though they have uh, basically the same kind of uh, accounting uh, process. By that, I mean that uh, the process uh, really has uh, four, four steps to it. So when people ask you what is accounting, uh, you cannot just repeat the word accounting is accounting. So what is accounting? Uh, well, accounting means that we identify certain transactions and events to analyze their consequences. We recognize certain economic resources as assets, certain obligations as liabilities. So the assets and liabilities are technical terms in accounting that we have to be very careful in giving definition. We also decide uh, to measure, but how to measure? We have to use a certain kind of monetary valuation uh, to assign uh, the amounts. And also we have to decide what to disclose in financial report and to whom. So these are all the steps when I say certain, it really means uncertain. Uh, because we have to make decisions. So when people say that uh, accounting is accounting, uh, I, I really uh, started to give them a lecture uh, that in doing accounting before we can put any numbers down at all, we have to make a whole series of decisions about the sort of our choices that we will be making. So when you look at this accounting, uh, equations, there are really two formats, so there are two versions. One is, uh, shall we say, the static version that uh, represents uh, the balance sheet. The other one is the dynamic version that represents the change in the net asset and the uh, asset and liabilities. And these then become the income statements, you see. So in a lot of ways, uh, these are, are very similar to what you have learned in uh, in business accounting. In fact, uh, the, uh, 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 the International Public Sector Accounting Standards Board use uh, this uh, from the first uh, statement of the Ipsos Board. They issued this in the year 2000. And you see that they look very much like a uh, uh, business uh, financial statement. But since uh, these are really templates, 
lending forms. Let me uh, give you a consolidated financial statement uh, from the United States government uh, uh, that uh, when we now have available to us the uh, consolidated financial statement of the U.S. government from the year 1973. So, Yang, could you please uh, turn to slide number 43, uh, please? I want to show you some numbers. Slide number 43. Uh, the numbers would be really quite uh, uh, startling uh, 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 to you. Well, at the end of uh, fiscal year 2019, on September 30th, 2019, just last year, the total asset of the US government was a $4 trillion. That's one followed by 12 zeros, okay? Liabilities was $27 trillion and the net asset and negative $23 trillion. So maybe net asset should be called net, liabil net liabilities uh, 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 instead. Okay, so you can see that, uh, well, you know, that uh, these amount are really huge and we'll be coming back uh, to that uh, just a little bit later. So if we could go, go back to the, the slide number number nine to look at the, uh, the basic uh, financial statement. What I would like you to ask yourself is uh, maybe move up a little bit, Yang, uh, to look at so-called net asset section. Uh, you can see, well, no, a little bit high. Uh, no, to the next slide on the liabilities and assets. Uh, you'll see that uh, there's no owner's equity. There's no return earnings as well. And, uh, but uh, for the US government, the, 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 the US government issued bonds uh, and at the end of FY uh, 2019, it amounted to $17 uh, trillion. But that's not all. There are other government liabilities. Uh, these, are, these are boilerplate terms, don't mean very much. So let me just uh, give you a couple of uh, uh, examples. The amount of bonds payable was about $70 trillion but there was an additional $8 trillion of civilian employee, as well as military employee pension and the retirement benefits. So if you sign up for the US military, the US government will take care of you, your health for the rest, for the rest of your life. And they amounted to eight, about $8 trillion, okay? There's also the insurance and loan guarantees, as well as something called environmental liabilities. You probably have not heard of that. It's what the law requires the US government to clean up all the chemical sites and all the nuclear weapons that military uh, uh, bases, uh, they have to be clean for civilian use. Now, What's not on a typical government uh, balance sheet is a uh, public pension, social security in many, in many countries. In the case of the US government, the present value of projected deficits for social security, public pension for the United States, including me, by the way, I'm receiving social security the present value of projected deficit for the 19, for the next 75 years amounted to $59 trillion, almost $60 trillion for social security benefits. The underfunding of social security benefit is not considered a part of the US government liability. Furthermore, you may be surprised that the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, is not a part of the US government uh, financial statements. Why? The reason they say is the Fed independent.
independent. Now you see that the uh, oceans really matter uh, because they affect uh, the amount uh, of the uh, the amount of the asset and uh, and uh, liabilities. Uh, speaking of assets, uh, speaking of assets, uh, the U.S. government had uh, 1.4 trillion dollars of so-called PPE, uh, property, plant, and equipment. But don't take this number too seriously. This number has $1 trillion of the fixed asset of the Defense Department, but plus or minus an unknown amount. So the numbers are so unreliable. They even though since 1997, since 1997, the Government Accountability Office, the auditor of the U.S. government, headed by the Controller General, since 1997 has been auditing the consolidated financial statement of the U.S. government since 1997. And it has declined to issue an opinion on the CFS for the last 23 years. So this is uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Okay, so anyway, the, uh, the balance sheet is one of the, uh, one of the two statements. But let's uh, turn to the operating, uh, to the, to the operating statements. Uh, and you'll see that it looks like a business income statement very much. Uh, but uh, uh, some governments uh, like the US government and Yang, could you turn to, uh, uh, slide number 44. I want to show you some numbers uh, from the uh, from the operating statement of the U.S. government uh, for the fiscal year 20, 2019. The U.S. government turned the income statement upside down. It began with uh, expenses and then you deduct income. And it uses uh, some new terminology uh, for expenses, they call it costs cost of service. So expense means uh, cost of service in uh, American federal government accounting. So the format is like this. You'll find the expenses of each one of these services, like uh, national defense. You subtract the user charges, if any, okay? Uh, and you figure out the amount and you subtract general revenue. So they will give you the net income or net net loss. So the term net net cost means cost to taxpayers. And I give you two examples that are very dramatic uh, uh, examples. For defense, defense is a public good. You don't charge the public for it. So virtually all the cost of defense is a pay for taxpayers. On the other hand, uh, for postal service. Uh, 91%, 90% of the postal service uh, expenses are borne by, by uh, 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 customers. And for the government as a whole, it's 92% uh, of the costs are borne by uh, uh, taxpayers. Uh, so uh, when you look at all the total expenses and all the total revenue, for fiscal year 2019, the accrued deficits, shall we say net loss for the US government is $1.4 trillion, okay? At the beginning of the fiscal year uh, 2019, the net position, net financial position of the US government was at $21.5 trillion. So you are $21.5 trillion in the whole. And the operations for the year 2019 take yourself deeper in the hole by $1.4 trillion. So as of the end of 2019, the US government's net financial position was a negative $23 trillion. So please do me a favor and put a negative in front of the 23 uh, 
uh, trillion dollars. When we speak of services, uh, that's where the next uh, block of numbers will tell you. The U.S. government spent about 95, 94, 95 percent of all its expenses on three major categories, on health services and retirement benefit for the elderly and uh, for the poor in terms of the health care. Okay. Then it's a national defense. Uh, uh, it's another uh, big amount, $1.2 trillion. But there's something invisible. Very few people know about this. In the recent year, in last year, the US government spent $400 billion in interests for all the money that you borrow, you see. So, so these are the top big three, okay? And you ask the question, why, why is the US government in such a bad shape? The reason is uh, since 9-11, uh, the US has been fighting a so-called war on terror. And how much does that cost? Well, so far it costs about $5.5 trillion. And there's another estimated one trillion dollars to take care of the veterans, the returned soldiers for their medical and for their disability uh, services. So the total war on terror is going to cost a total of six trillion dollars uh, for the United States. Now think about it. This is not the cost for all the people involved. It doesn't count anything about the cost to Iraq and Afghanistan because our accounting entity is the US government itself only. Uh, so who you do the accounting for is also very, very uh, 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 important, important here. Uh, so uh, let's uh, quickly uh, return to the basic uh, financial statement, as you know, uh, there's the cash flow statement and uh, uh, the US government's uh, cash flow statement is so complicated, uh, uh, we don't have time to go into all the details. Suffice to point out that the reason why we need the uh, cash flow statement uh, is uh, because the, all the accrues numbers have all the uh, receivables and payables, but uh, uh, really the lifeblood of any business and government is the cash. So let me just give you a few numbers uh, to show you the cash operation of the U.S. government. Uh, the U.S. government has very little cash on hand. Uh, at the end of a typical uh, fiscal year, it's only uh, $500 billion or so. It borrows short term all the time. Okay, so for example, in this year, it borrowed a twelve trillion dollars, but it paid back eleven <laughs> trillion dollars uh, in 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 the same year, uh, and uh, and as I mentioned to you, the U.S. government paid a lot of interest, uh, four hundred billion dollars uh, a, a year. So you can see that, as I said, uh, the amounts are really huge, uh, and so I I get. Uh, I kind of get excited, you know, I have a sense of importance <laughs> uh, uh, in, in studying a federal uh, uh, government uh, because obviously the U.S. government is the largest and the most complex organization uh, in, the, in the whole world and it's uh, having a tremendous uh, impact. And, uh, and as you know, we are transitioning from one administration to the next, but I don't want to uh, give you a digression on that. Uh, maybe let me turn to my uh, colleague, uh, Yang Hailing, to kind of uh, wrap this up a little bit uh, and uh, talk about uh, uh, what we have, Yang, on slide 14, which uh, points out the unique, uh, the uniqueness, uh, the unique features of government and uh, summarize what we have talked about so far. So back to you, Yang. Please. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be with you. 
And uh, now let's let's talk a little bit uh, about the main features um, of new government accounting. And uh, so some of the features uh, which which make government, uh, in, in a sense, uh, unique. And, and the key point that you should take from that slide is is really that um, so the surface similarities between this new business-like kind of government accounting uh, does not really quite reveal the uniqueness uh, of, of government. And it's, um, I mean, what, what we saw is that regardless of, of the political system, um, only it's only the government that actually that can make laws, that can levy taxes, uh, you know, that can force people to, to do certain things, uh, put people in, into jail and, you know, things like that. And, and it's only, as I said, it's only the government that, that has such power. And so therefore that's, that's not comparable really to, to what you know from, from private sector. And so given that fact, also the numbers actually shown in government's financial statements, they should really reflect the economic, including the financial consequences of the government's use of such powers. So, I mean, just a few things um, you can think about. So government revenues, of course, it's revenue for the government, but on the other hand side, you know, it's it's actually the people's cost. Yeah, it's the pe the taxes that people are uh, are paying. But then the question, you know, who who is actually bearing uh, all those costs? And and uh, then secondly, I mean, government expenditures, of course, expenditures for the government, but you know, in the end, it's it's benefits. Uh, for the, for the people people, but you know who should who should benefit, and that's that's really government decisions in in the end. Then also government receivables, you know, are some people's payables. Yeah, when you think of of taxes again, and uh, you know the question is, you know, who is who is paying that? Uh, and the same the same situation for the government payables. On the other hand side, these are the receivables of some people's. But you know uh, who is going to receive that? So I mean, in short, what we would like to try to to bring that to your eyes is, um, you know, we want that you see the people behind the numbers, and to see who benefits and who pays uh, for what government activities. And I mean, just on this slide, when you now look at this slide, you you see a little bit, you know when it comes to transactions of government. Uh, so these main features and actually the, this non-reciprocity, you know, I really learned that in one of the government accounting classes by Professor Chan. And uh, so for example, when you think of tax receivables, they are, so in, in, in US government accounting, they are recognized when government has a legal claim against taxpayers rather than when services are rendered. I mean, this is, you know, this, this uh, uh, kind of a cruel principle that you know from uh, the private sectors, you know, uh, recognizing so this uh, uh, interrelationship between expenditures and, and uh, revenue, that is not really um, the case uh, for, for a lot of government uh, transactions. Then maybe secondly, um, uh, claim payables, they are recognized when government assumes responsibility rather than when benefits are received. And as a consequence, net worth has meanings in government different from businesses because of the uniqueness of those transactions. And now just quickly on the next slide, um, I mean, the, the key point uh, that you see on that slide is, so changes to tra traditional government accounting were made in response to shortcomings of cash budgeting, the cash basis, short-term focus, and in many jurisdictions, also uh, voluminous reports in, in countries and a lack of transparency in others. Good, and Jim, with that, uh, I would like to hand over back to you, Jim. Well, you have uh, on the screen there is the report of a paper I wrote uh, uh, about uh, 10 years ago called How Much Red Ink, uh, discussing 
the uh, financial situation of the U.S. government. So I'm tempted to attempt to uh, update <laughs> uh, the uh, this this paper because on the right hand side you see is uh, the end of the first decade of uh, the 20th first century, and do you remember what happened? Or oh, you are too young. <laughs> you are too young to remember what happened uh, in the in the year 2008. How old were you? For most of you, you probably were not thinking about accounting uh, at that time. Well, let me remind you that uh, we have a big uh, financial crisis, a banking crisis that became a economic uh, crisis. And uh, you are now reading about the Great uh, Recession. Uh, so what happened? Well, this uh, chart uh, uh, shows uh, the liabilities of the US government uh, at the end of each one of those years. Now, the US government has uh, September 30th as the end of the fiscal year, the end of the third quarter. So keep that in mind, okay? And I mentioned before that uh, liabilities is really a technical term in accounting. Uh, economists and public finance people, budgeting people, uh, like to just talk about debt. For us, that means uh, bonds payable, bonds and notes, securities. There are two bars, the darker one represent liabilities as recognized by accountants. The lighter bar is the total federal securities held by the, pub, by the public. Now you can see the general pattern that total liabilities always, always exceed the total among securities. It's just a question of how much. And I gave you an answer already that the difference, the big part of the difference between total liabilities and the securities, almost half of it is payables, benefits payables to federal employees, both civilian and military as well as a military uh, 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 veterans. Uh, but uh, this, the, the data are, are, are 10 years old already. So let me give you a quick update about what happened uh, in, the last, in the last 10 years. The total liabilities, you can see that uh, uh, for the uh, year 2010 was about $16 trillion. How much is the total amount now? It's $27 trillion, an increase of $11 trillion uh, in the last decades. Okay. How about the total amount of bonds payable? At the end of 2010, it was $9 trillion. And now it's a 17, almost double in the past in the past decades. So that gives you a sense of magnitude as to what, what happened. Uh, so it's, uh, it's important to realize uh, that uh, one benefit of reading the government's uh, balance sheet is to know all the liabilities that uh, economists and public finance people don't talk about uh, very much the non-bonded debt kind of uh, uh, liabilities. Let's uh, take a look at something very fascinating. I wish I had all the time in the world to talk to you about that. Uh, let's turn to slide 17. Uh, this is a fascinating uh, uh, chart, okay? As I said, uh, the, the right-hand side three years represent the period uh, of the great uh, financial crisis. Uh, but then look at what happened at the beginning uh, of that decade. The darker bar represents accrued deficit. 
So notice that uh, we turn the, instead of uh, uh, deficit being negative, we flip the chart uh, uh, upward, okay? So, so the higher the bar, the greater the amount of deficit, the greater amount of the negative, negative number. Look at the year 2001. What happened in the year 2001? It's the year of 9-11, I remind you. The first year of the George W. Bush administration in the United States. Now that year then will carry over the effects of the previous, previous administration, the Clinton uh, administration for eight years. And look at the lighter uh, bar. A negative here is actually actually double negative, meaning a surplus. For the first time in many, many years, for almost 50 years, President Clinton managed to achieve a surplus for the US federal government. Okay. But it's a cash surplus. Look at the left at the darker bar. It's a, about $500 billion of accrued deficit. Now, put your kind of knowledge to work. Why is it that uh, accrued deficit, think of it as a net loss in business accounting? Why would you have a cash surplus and yet a accrued loss. Think about the accounting equation, okay? I mentioned to you, oh, you probably, you may or may not know, except for the Americans, uh, Professor Allen, <laughs> uh, you know that uh, we have a, uh, a federal income uh, tax, uh, uh, estimated tax, so we have to turn in our estimated tax in cash to the US government uh, uh, periodically. So most of the difference between the cash and the accrued basis really is on the expense, uh, on, the, on the spending side. Now, think about what is expense. Expense is an increase in expense and then Think about your double entry, okay? It'll be either a decrease in the use of uh, of your assets or an increase in liabilities, right? So the accrued deficit here represents the delayed cost of services that you don't have to pay. So by policy and by practice, the US government delayed a great deal of the cost of current services to the future for cash payment. Everything get pushed back. And that's the reason why you have a dramatic difference of almost $600 trillion. I mean, no, $600 billion in the difference between the cash surplus and the, and the accrual uh, deficit. So, Fast forward uh, to, uh, uh, to 2008, the first year, uh, the beginning of the financial crisis, and even more so to the year uh, uh, to, uh, uh, 2009, and look at what, look at what happened, okay? Uh, in the year 2009, you may want to just jot down this number. So although the data uh, for this slide, uh, uh, for the bar chart is one of the slides that we'll be providing uh, to you, okay? The amount of cash deficits was $1.4 trillion. That's cash deficit, okay? But the amount of accrued deficit was $1.25 trillion. Okay, now, so do you notice anything strange in the year 2009? 
in all the previous years, I would say for almost all years, the amount of accrued deficit was greater than the amount of cash deficit for the reasons that I indicated, because the US government habitually pushed cost of service to the future for payment. But what happened in the year 2009? In a financial crisis, as is now, what did the US government do? Expand a lot of cash expend a lot of cash, buying failing institutions, assisting, investing in failing institutions and so forth. And all those are cash payments added to the cash deficit. So for the first time in many, many, many years, when in a, five, in a financial crisis, the US government pumped cash into the economy and they outpaced uh, the accumulation of the non-cash uh, uh, expenses, okay? But uh, very quickly to the next year, 2010, uh, you can see uh, that uh, the usual pattern uh, returns uh, uh, already. Uh, so let's uh, quick, take a quick look at the year at the year 10, just uh, to scrutinize a little bit, and also to point out to you the importance in terminology uh, as well. Now, this is uh, one of the tables uh, in my paper using the year uh, 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 2010 uh, as an as an uh, 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 example, and uh, this is a, a just an exact copy. Uh, of what's the US, US uh, government budget document. But I feel obligated to do some annotations because uh, accountants will find the terminology rather strange. What the budget document calls a budget measure actually was uh, accounting, actual accounting numbers, okay? Uh, so the deficit was the amount of actual cash deficits. The cash revenue is called actual receipts and cash expenditure is called outlay. So the amount of deficit uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the year, uh, what was uh, the number that I have? For the year was at uh, one point, uh, one point three uh, a trillion dollars uh, for for uh, for this year, but if you look at the amount of the uh, of the deficit on the accrual basis, and even uh, uh, furthermore, uh, if you look at the uh, amount of the assets and liabilities, uh, these are the things that we report. The point I want to make is this. Economists and public finance people, budgeting people, pay attention to one particular year. But accountants pay attention not only to the year, but also to the financial position, to the accumulated assets and liabilities up to that particular uh, point in time. And that's why uh, I think that is uh, what is unique about accrual uh, accounting. Uh, we, uh, as accountants, use the term accrual uh, almost instinctively. Uh, but accrual in the business accounting sense usually refers to the accrual basis for the recognition of revenue. But the term accrual in business, in, in government accounting, uh, really represent a shift, a big shift. Uh, in how one looks at an entity's finance. Accrual accounting in government means that you pay a lot of attention to the accumulated numbers. To accrue means to accumulate. So accrual accounting 
shift attention to one period to the cumulative financial position in terms of asset and liabilities. That is uh, really one of the most important things that uh, uh, that uh, I would like you to uh, to uh, remember. Well, uh, we are now in the uh, uh, in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> in the uh, space, particularly series uh, in the in the United States. So I want to uh, give you a quick update uh, on how the uh, the pandemic uh, and the economic response of the U.S. government, financial response and budgetary response of the U.S. government uh, has done uh, to the uh, to the U.S. government's uh, uh, financial situation. Uh, right now, uh, this is the Thanksgiving week uh, in the United States, uh, the end of November. The fiscal year of the U.S. government for the fiscal year 2020 ended almost uh, uh, two months ago. Two weeks, only two weeks after the end of the fiscal year, the Treasury Department was able to give you the information you see on the screen to let you know the amount of cash deficits for the fiscal year 2020. And what was that amount? It's $3.1 trillion. Okay. The previous year's uh, deficit was, we thought, huge already. It's almost $1 trillion. It's unheard of. But then the FY20 deficit on a cash basis, on a cash basis, was three times that amount and $2 trillion more than the projected deficit of $1 trillion just made earlier that year. So you can see, uh, you may say that, uh, that uh, uh, for most of the world, uh, most of Americans, uh, this is the worst times. But uh, professionally, uh, this is the most interesting time for me as a government accountant, <laughs> uh, because there are a lot of things for us to think about, about how the government financial situation is being portrayed by the government. Uh, because as you know, uh, right now the big debate in the US government now is whether to lend more assistance for the federal government to lend more assistance uh, to the American people, American businesses, and so forth. What does that mean? That means putting a lot of uh, money in people's pockets and to help uh, business. So in a way, by helping the economy recover, sustain itself, the federal government is deliberately making itself worse off, thanks to Kenshin economics. So uh, I'm reminded to pay tribute <laughs> to the great uh, Cambridge eco economist, uh, John Maynard Kings. Uh, uh, and, and, and actually, you know, it's what inspires me uh, to be interested in uh, government accounting you are talking about some major, major kind of uh, 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 issues behind this uh, series of, of, of numbers. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to wait until next spring to know the total liabilities number, to have the balance sheet of the US government. But at least uh, we very quickly now we already know uh, that uh, the uh, the cash consequences and what the U.S. government did 
uh, uh, to, uh, but as you know, you know, uh, the US government really didn't have to cash. <laughs> So what do you do? It follows. So let me, uh, uh, to make sure I don't confuse the millions and billions and trillions, let me just uh, read what the Treasury Secretary said in terms of borrowing. He said, total federal borrowing from the public, the public meaning not only individuals, but uh, anybody who will invest in Treasury securities, increase by the important word is by, by a certain amount, by $4.2 trillion, okay? In one year alone, the US government debt increased by $4.2 trillion. During FY20 to $21 trillion. Now, remember that, that there was another $10 trillion or so in terms of uh, liabilities other than securities. So my personal uh, projection is that uh, the amount of US government security uh, at the end of FY uh, fiscal year 2020 will be about uh, $30 uh, trillion uh, at least. Now that's the accountants in me talking, okay? Uh, because if you talk to a, an economist, uh, the economy will say, yeah, sure, the numbers are large, but are they too large? Or maybe they're too small. Why? So the economists will smile at the accountants and say, see, we are the ones that make sense because you have to relate the federal government's number to the macroeconomic statistics to the size of the economy to put the numbers in context, you see. So there's a very uh, uh, important uh, uh, relationship uh, between, uh, between the uh, uh, government uh, accounting, government finance statistics, and the national income uh, uh, statistics. And those are the topics that uh, Yang Hailing and uh, Marion uh, and I have been studying. Uh, that's the top of our uh, of our research uh, 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 agenda. Well, since uh, you are you are you are Cambridge, I don't know how many of you are on the campus now, <laughs> but Lisa, uh, you are registered at the British University. Let me uh, show you the uh, UK counterpart to what the US government is doing. And this is just a quick summary from the old paper, again, uh, uh, from uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, uh, 2010. Uh, in this number, it shows uh, basically a, a one, uh, uh, one sheet uh, that give you all the summary uh, uh, statistics of the uh, UK uh, government uh, at the end of uh, uh, 20, uh, 2010. Uh, you are probably familiar uh, with uh, the structure, revenue minus expenditures, deficit, asset minus liability. And what I wanted to point out, there will be two things to you. The numbers are too small. I'll just uh, mention two things that are worth remembering when you review this uh, chart after the, the lecture. Instead of calling the negative number negative net asset, the uh, UK Treasury was more direct about it. It just calls it negative uh, net liabilities. <laughs> okay, net liabilities. Uh, sounds, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, sounds uh, more uh, descriptive uh, uh, to me. And the other one is that the US government cause the negative net financial position, net position, and a negative number, the negative uh, $23 trillion. I like uh, the British terminology better. It's, it calls this the amount to be financed by future revenue. What does it mean? It's telling UK's taxpayers, say this is the amount 
that we are leaving to future generations of taxpayers to pay. So that is a really the implication of negative uh, financial uh, uh, position. So, so far, we basically have uh, told you about uh, how accrual accounting has applied uh, to the United States, uh, to Britain, and uh, uh, all the uh, 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 advanced uh, English-speaking uh, uh, countries. But as I said, this is not the way it has been. But uh, how did we get here? Uh, and for that kind of uh, perspective, let me ask Yang to tell you a little bit of the history of this kind of uh, a very high degree kind of accrual that are put uh, fixed assets on the balance sheet, as well as a lot of long-term liabilities on the other side of the balance sheet. Yang, so tell us what happened. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jim. Um, yeah, so where are we uh, in the journey uh, of the new government accounting? And I mean, you have to see new uh, is really, how new is that? It's actually, it's just emulating uh, business financial accounting. So you can already start asking, is it is it that really new? And um, I mean, also in terms of what is new, yeah? Is it, uh, you know, just accrual accounting? Is it uh, preparing consolidated financial statement? Or is it even, so like in the UK, in the UK, you are preparing whole of government accounts. Yeah? This is a little bit different uh, to the concept of preparing consolidated uh, financial statements. So given the fact that with whole of government accounts, you are really consolidating, let's say, all the public sector entities of a country. And it's very rare uh, um, yeah, internationally that, that governments have really gone at that stage um, of, of the new uh, government accounting. So let me maybe start uh, with, uh, you know, one, one of the founders uh, of the new government accounting. And it's uh, here, you see it's uh, in the US. And as outlined by, by Jim in, in the beginning, it's uh, actually, it was in the uh, beginning of the early 20th century uh, when the reforms uh, started uh, to develop. And so the progressives were arguing for having balance sheet actually at the municipal government level. And then from 1974, so really just one year after I was born, uh, from that onwards, uh, accrual accounting and consolidated reporting uh, for federal governments uh, started. So that debate uh, uh, started. Okay, and, that's what I will show you. That's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Mr. Mr. Bauscher, so he, he was certainly uh, one, one of the influential people during, during that time. And then from 1979 onwards, uh, accrual accounting and increasingly aggregated financial statements for state and lo local governments uh, that um, was then, uh, then ongoing. And for the US, you would have to see there are actually two accounting standards board. Um, so one uh, of those boards, so that is the government accounting standards board that focuses on the state and local government level, whereas the FASEP, so the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, that actually just focuses on the uh, federal uh, level. But uh, both of the boards, they share, let's say, broad principles. But, you know, when it comes to the details, you will then still see uh, differences. Uh, between then the, the, the actual accounting treatment at, you know, different uh, government entities. And I mean, one of the special fe features uh, for the um, local governments and state governments is really the use of fund accounting. And uh, I mean, uh, Jim will uh, talk a little bit later on uh, about uh, fund accounting, which is qu quite unique. You know, me coming from Europe, 
so I was visiting Jim during my PhD and, you know, I never came across uh, fund accounting and it, it was really actually in the US uh, when I, when I uh, really came across uh, fund accounting. And uh, I mean, and of course, uh, after the, U the US, I mean, it, it were clearly the other uh, English speaking countries uh, that were taking up the reforms and uh, really the, uh, you know, the, the countries and still as of today, which are really leading that reform, it's Australia, it's New Zealand, it, and it's the UK. And it was, it dates back to the beginning in the 1980s. Um, that those countries started to advocate uh, for that new government accounting. And uh, I mean, especially when you look at Australia, New Zealand in the beginning and the UK, they were actually taking the IFRS as a basis uh, for their um, governmental accounting system. And I mean, that, that is uh, quite uh, unique. Uh, I would say that uh, they were actually taking a, a, an accounting framework that was actually made for the private sector, also bringing that into the public sector. I mean, you have to see for the UK, UK now is also using where IFRS has, an, has a gap in an accounting treatment. For example, when it comes to the accounting for taxes, then the UK government also makes use of um, the um, of the IPSAS, so the, the accounting requirements, what, what the International Public Sector Accounting Standards Board uh, has came up with. And, and it's called a second, it's a, a second level guidance. Good, and now let's maybe come, uh, let me come to speaking uh, about the latest development and uh, probably you have already heard about those international public sector accounting standards. And that development actually started in the 1996. So the IPSAS board, so that is the board that is in charge of setting those uh, uh, standards. That is a board under the umbrella of the IFAC. IFAC, that's the International Federation of Accountants. And probably you know the International um, Auditing uh, Standard, Standards Board. Um, that is also a board uh, that is under the umbrella of IFAC. And uh, it was around the, the beginning of the 1990s where actually IFAC found that there is a gap actually in, uh, in having, uh, let's say, international standards uh, for the public sector. And so IFAC, uh, so the public sector committee of IFAC took that up and that ended up then uh, in 1996 uh, with uh, having the IPSAS board uh, starting to be a standard setters for public sector accounting. And uh, I mean, in, in terms of the, um, let's say the architecture of the IPSAS, IPSAS is, they actually are built on IFRSs. So um, at that, especially at that time in the beginning. So in the beginning, the, the IPSAS board, you know, they looked at what IFRS was doing and only where the IPSAS B saw a need to have something specific for the public sector, then they brought in new terminology or sometimes may, maybe even, uh, you know, unique uh, uh, features for the public sector. But what the IPSAS B then also quickly found out that, you know, in the public sector, they are really unique transactions. For example, all around those non-exchange transactions. For example, accounting for taxes, accounting for transfers, accounting also for infrastructure assets, or to deal you know, on the relationship between budgeting and accounting. So the IPSAS B, so starting with IPSAS 2021, impairment of non-cash generating asset, IPSAS 23, accounting for non-exchange revenues, uh, IPSAS 24 on the relationship of budgets and actual uh, amounts in financial statements. So these are really, let's say, unique standards for the public sector where there is no IFRS equivalent. So that is in, prin uh, in principle what the IPSAS B is uh, doing since 1996. And, you know, the journey with uh, developing IPSAS is that is still going on and um, I mean, at the moment we are at IPSAS 42, that's uh, the one on social benefits. And uh, I mean, there is still 
you know, uh, further Ipsos is coming through in the, in the future. I mean, you, you might ask what is going on in Europe? I mean, you, you know, we have seen um, the slides, uh, what happened to the US government uh, during the financial crisis. And I mean, similar things happened over here in, in Europe in 2009, 10 and 11. And so one of the outcomes of the sovereign debt crisis uh, that started around 2009, 10 and, and even in 11, it continued. The European Commission started working on abscesses. I mean, of course, you see, you know, the similarity uh, in the term to, to the abscesses. So abscesses stands for European Public Sector Accounting Standards. But here I can tell you, as of now, there is no single European Public Sector Accounting Standard at the moment. So since 2011, the European Commission is working on that. I mean, there is of course a lot of work involved in that and really to, you know, to identify the problem and to, to really, uh, you know, identifying what can be done to overcome the issues uh, that, that have started in, in uh, during the sovereign debt crisis. And I mean, you know, also in these times and especially when you think of Germany, currently we have a balance sheet scandal uh, but, um, you know, that, that balance sheet scandal in the private sector, I mean, when we look at the public sector and the, the, actually the, the, the reporting of the, the Greek statistical authority, you know, you can also say, I mean, that is a balance sheet, uh, a balance sheet scandal. Uh, also, also at that time, you know, when the, the Greece, Greek um, statistical authority revised their deficit reporting for a few times, you know, the Greek uh, government is is obliged to report uh, their debt figures uh, to and deficit figures uh, to Eurostat. That's the statistical authority in the European Union. And that debt figure that was really revised, and that triggered in the end also the sovereign debt crisis. And uh, so, therefore, you know, it it was recognized that the reporting that we have within the uh, European Union that certainly needs to be improved and. The, uh, the government accounting a part in the reporting was identified as one of the major weaknesses in that. And, uh, and um, I mean, you see on that slide that it, in, in the past years, it was mainly uh, the big four, you can say even the big two uh, accounting consulting firms. So including my firm uh, that were uh, advising the European Commission or Eurostat uh, in, 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 that, in those reforms. Well, so yeah, it looks like Ipsos is, uh, shall we say, the accountants and consultants mm -hmm. full employment act. <laughs> you guys uh, will be in your jobs forever and ever. Uh, let's, uh, time is uh, moving quickly. Let me uh, maybe look back and tell you how uh, government accounting is done uh, in uh, still in uh, most countries uh, in the world. Can I? Uh, because that's a really a big question. Uh, if you listen to the Ipsos board, uh, their sponsors and their consultants, uh, it sounds pretty good. So why don't people do that? Well, it's not really that simple to prepare a balance sheet with all those affects assets and all those liabilities, you see. Uh, and by the way, when Yang was talking about international public sector accounting standards, the accounting standards are really financial accounting standards and external reporting. I'm sure that you know that uh, there's another type of accounting called management accounting that involves uh, preparation of budget cost accounting and that kind of thing. And uh, in, the, uh, in the public sector, uh, accounting for daily use is uh, heavily influenced by uh, budgeting uh, uh, practices. So, 
Uh, I'm, I just uh, sketch out, uh, Yang, if we could uh, move on and uh, show our audience. Okay, there you go. Okay, what you have in here is uh, basically a sketch. Uh, that uh, Department Revenue Office would uh, keep track of on a daily basis. You know, one thing unique about government financial accounting is that when at the beginning of the fiscal year, budgetary numbers are entered into the financial accounts. So the revenue, a particular revenue, uh, is really anything, a uh, grant, a uh, gift, or whatever, uh, will be entered into the account. So when you look at the columns, it's the projected amount obtained uh, from the forecast or the revenue authorization. In the middle column is the amount that's actually collected. So put the word cash <laughs> in that column, which right away tells you that uh, as far as revenue is concerned in the financial management uh, system, a lot of attention is paid uh, to cash collected rather than taxes receivable. And the last column is the amount that remains to be uh, 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 collected. So you can see that uh, the uh, government by necessity maintains this kind of record on a timely basis to provide feedback to the government, to the financial managers, as to how much they have collected in cash and how much they remain uh, to be collected. And they don't wait until the end of the year to say, whoops, we have a revenue shortfall, but they try to keep it on a more timely basis. So the message is, in addition to any reporting, government needs more timely type of reporting to provide feedback because, you know, if uh, there's a recession, you revise down the uh, revenue projection, for example. You know, or in good times, and maybe you want to increase the, so you monitor the actual cash collection relative uh, to the forecast on one side of the budget. And on the spending side of the budget, and this is uh, where most people think of uh, as uh, government uh, budgeting. But uh, keep in mind, the budget really has uh, two sides. Young, next slide, please. Uh, here, uh, we're spending a little bit more time on that because the appropriation means that uh, the financial plan is uh, submitted by the executive for legislative approval. So appropriation is the legislature's permission authorization to, to the executive department to spend money in a certain ways up to a certain amount for necessary uh, uh, items. The middle column has a very loaded word use what do we mean by use of appropriation? It's the amount that's chargeable, the amount that can be deducted from the appropriation. And the last column is the amount that the manager uh, uh, pays uh, most attention to. What is the amount of the available balance? Uh, uh, and that's the amount that should be monitored on a, a monthly basis. Okay, now, as I said, a very unique feature of government accounting is to enter the appropriation number into the financial accounts. And this becomes, shall we say, the budgetary accounting module of government accounting, with uh, the financial accounting being the other part of uh, uh, government accounting. Now, when cash is spent, say $20,000, it's $80,000 remains to be spent. But what happens 
when a government issues a purchase order. Now, stop for a minute, okay? What's the point of uh, keeping this kind of accounting, of having this kind of accounting system? If your purpose is to prevent overspending, overspending, wouldn't you be tempted to count, to recognize the purchase order or your contractual obligation, your commitments as a legitimate item to be charged to the appropriation, to be deducted from the appropriation so that the available balance will have a smaller number to tell you that, hey, look, you cannot make more coming months. It's not just cash spent. So herein we come across a very serious problem. And that is, uh, in account, we said the accrual accounting is uh, a basis uh, for uh, financial accounting. And we use that to recognize expense. But and sometimes we use the word uh, expenditure to mean the use of financial resources. And definitely cash outlay qualifies. Uh, for that. But when you issue a purchase order, what does it mean? You are telling your supplier that I want to buy this, to buy a certain item or to buy a certain kind of service. If the supplier says yes, then you have a contract. Then you have to pay once the good is delivered. But what before the good is delivered, we have this budgetary accountant that tells you that for budgetary control purposes, the purchase order and offer to purchase becomes a kind of quasi spending, kind of uh, advanced uh, reservation of the appropriation pending the delivery of the service. Okay, so that's called the budgetary basis for uh, this kind of uh, for this kind of uh, measurement uh, uh, system but uh, budgetary basis doesn't have a standard meaning some jurisdictions say okay we count only cash and some will be more aggressive say hey we look uh, the moment we issue a purchase order uh, then uh, you have to take it out of the uh, of the uh, uh, appropriations, okay? Uh, so uh, here is uh, a, a very, very complicated, sophisticated kind of budgetary accounting for budgetary control. So uh, actually, you know, if there's uh, additional appropriation, uh, for example, uh, then uh, uh, there will be uh, added uh, to the available balance. And actually, this is uh, what has happened uh, during the pandemic crisis, uh, because uh, the U.S. Uh, government, uh, President Trump, applied uh, to Congress uh, for a supplemental appropriation of uh, two trillion dollars. It's a T, okay, uh, and uh, uh, for uh, the drug company. Uh, to develop a vaccine. Uh, uh, and uh, so the US government agency turned around and signed a contract for $1.95 billion, almost $2 billion with the drug company uh, Pfizer to develop a vaccine. Now, I would like you to think about this, okay? How do you account, how, what journal entry will you make when the US government signed a contract with a Pfizer for $1.95 billion that says that uh, go ahead to develop vaccine when it's done, we'll 
will what? Will take delivery. <laughs> okay, but right now you need the cash. So I give you 1.5, 1.95 billion dollars in cash so that you have the money to do the development and to the to, 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 to come with the vaccine. Uh, the answer, actually, I'm recommending this be a test question <laughs> uh, for you because it's a very good example that brings in business accounting as a government accounting. But let's move on because these are uh, kind of continuous kind of uh, accounting uh, during the year. Then at the end of the year, we do an annual summary of the actual amount for revenue, for spending, as well as the budget amount, both the original budget and the revised budget. Because as I told you earlier, you know, uh, uh, in the middle of the fiscal year, in the first quarter of the of the fiscal year, the pandemic happened, and the U.S. government had to quickly uh, increase uh, its uh, 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 expenditure uh, for the year. So it's important to have both the original and the final. And the last column is the difference between the actual and the final budget. This is almost exactly the same as you have in your standard cost accounting system. We call the last call, the last uh, column variance. Uh, so the difference could be favorable or unfavorable. But favorable to whom and unfavorable to whom? We're preparing this from the perspective of the government. If you collected less revenue than anticipated, we say it's bad. Bad for the government, but maybe good for taxpayers. And when you overspend your appropriation, we say it's bad for financial control. But, you know, if you are someone who receives a government service, it may be good for you. So you see, so the perspective really matters a lot in interpreting the numbers when we say that we want to produce information uh, useful uh, for, for users. Well, when you have two different ways of measuring something that seems to be similar, a accrual basis, a cash basis, and a budgetary basis, it's very confusing to people who look at all these numbers. So we need to help people out by doing what is called a reconciliation. So Yang, let's uh, turn to the next uh, uh, slide because, you uh, know, uh, go on. Okay, there we go. Okay. Now here, you see every government official wants to say, I balance my budget. Okay. So what does the balance budget mean uh, in the context of the, uh, uh, one part of the city of Chicago a uh, long time ago in the year 2008. The budget was balanced uh, with uh, revenue of a slightly over 3 million and uh, it also has, uh, uh, is it possible to move up the, the screen a little bit? So I can see the whole, I can see the whole screen. Uh, well, uh, the budget is balanced with uh, revenue and expenditure of uh, both equal to three, uh, uh, three point one uh, billion dollars or so. So, the, but how is the budget balanced? The budget is balanced by counting their proceeds as a part of part of what? Part of revenue. So one running battle I have with the finance people is to tell them that accountants take the word revenue seriously. And we don't count borrowed money as revenue. We call that debt proceeds, the amount of cash you collect by issuing bonds. 
So revenue and finance, re collecting revenue is a means of financing, but borrowing is also a means of uh, financing. So the purpose of this uh, analysis is to say, uh, we have two sets of numbers. We have two sets of numbers and therefore we have to explain. And it really makes a lot of difference because uh, if you use the measuring method of the budget, of the budgeting people, the budget is balanced. But if you use the accountant's method, then you have a $232 million uh, deficit. So where does, where does the difference come about? It comes about when you include as revenue things it shouldn't be, like borrow money and fund transfer from the other part of the government, use the surplus from the previous year. And on the spending side, remember what I said earlier about purchase commitments, okay? For budgeting, when you issue a purchase order, you count it as uh, like spending, but accountants is when you have to pay uh, when you receive a goods and services and you make the payment for services and goods received. So this is, uh, this is a very important but somewhat uh, technical kind of exercise. Let me move on quickly to talk a little bit about uh, a unique feature of American accounting. Uh, in order to constrain exec executive action, uh, American government use a fund accounts, a fund. A fund is a simply a pool of resources for specific uh, purposes. Uh, so they're funds that for the, the resources that are not yours, you're acting as a trustee, for, for example, for retirees, and their funds established for business enterprises in the government. And so the core of the government is the so-called governmental funds. So let's move on, uh, Yang. Uh, and one particular type of governmental fund is, uh, sh shall we say, special revenue fund. The funds are for specific purposes. For example, you know, if you uh, levy a tax on chemical companies or for pollution control, for example, then you have to use the money for environmental uh, 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 protection. So what we do is we combine the individual fund into a particular fund type. The, the fund type is a special revenue, uh, uh, special revenue fund. And when you have a special revenue fund type, moving even more into the overall context. Next slide, Yang. The Special revenue fund is only one of four governmental fund types to constitute what is called a government fund group. And we call that kind of statement combined financial statement. So contrast this with the consolidated financial statement that put the a whole of government in one column. This is uh, really what I wanted to draw your attention. This is much more granular, much more detailed for the internal operations uh, of the government. So we can then put the, all the fund groups together to have a government-wide, a whole of government financial statement, uh, which is kind of similar uh, to the uh, consolidated kind of a financial statement. So the same as uh, with a crew, in doing financial reporting, we have to decide how aggregated the financial statements uh, have to be. Uh, so to wrap up everything we've said so far, the old and new government accounting differ in two respects, the measurement methodology and the degree of aggregation in, in financial uh, uh, reporting. And uh, we are recommending some uh, readings uh, for you as well as uh, uh, some websites uh, that you can go to see the live 
the actual financial uh, uh, statement. But we thought it would be nice uh, since uh, Yang is a consultant and I was uh, a consultant for the IMF, uh, going around the world uh, telling people to do good uh, uh, government accounting. But what is good government accounting? We want to run through an exercise uh, so that uh, you will be a highly paid consultant as well when you graduate. So young, uh, tell them what to do. Give them yeah. an engagement. <laughs> an engagement code even. <laughs> um, just a, that, That's just an EY uh, joke. Um, so, I mean, your task, uh, students, now is um, the following. So you are engaged as a consultant by the World Bank to review the design of an operating statement of the government of a developing country. And uh, I mean, uh, such a developing country, I mean, that could be, for example, I mean, thinking of maybe Belize or Guatemala, I mean, th th those kind of countries really, you know, not that well developed and uh, really, yeah, probably also facing financial, financial issues. So um, the current format that I'm showing you uh, now in the next slide is uh, recommended by the cash basis Ipsos uh, as developed in 2010. So that standard uh, was intended mainly for developing countries not ready to adopt the accrual basis Ipsos. Jan, could you put it on the screen? Yeah, shall I? Yeah. So you can see that here. And the World Bank endorses the Ipsos to developing countries and has also provided funding, of course. Yeah, consultants, they, <laughs> they need money uh, for doing their job. And um, so the World Bank is, is currently funding the implementation uh, of, of that uh, um, cash basis Ipsos. And your client, so the Ministry of Finance of that developing country, they received a, a grant from the World Bank to study the feasibility of transition to accrual. And it has tentatively decided to implement the cash basis Ipsos for the time being. Yeah, and I mean, now please uh, take uh, one or two, two minutes, uh, take a look at uh, the uh, existing cash basis operating uh, statement uh, that you see uh, there. And uh, yeah, please take a look and maybe also keep in mind what, we, what you have heard uh, so far. So one or two minutes, please take a look at that. Think about what is right and what is not quite right uh, in this. It's called a cash basis uh, uh, accounting standard. You know the cash flow so how does it look different or the same with the cash flow? And, uh, and it's labeled as an operating statement, but it's really an operating statement. What are the things that belong or don't belong to an operating uh, statement? So these are the questions they should be running through in your mind, you see. So this is, we call it a, consulting engagement, but actually it's a test. <laughs> uh, and uh, so what is right, what is not quite right, and what else should be there, you see, uh, because it's, it doesn't seem to be quite right for them to just have fun financial statement. The whole idea of financial accounting is that it takes a package of three financial statement, the balance sheet and operating statement on the accrual basis, and then a cash flow statement. But there's a difference between cash flow analysis and cash basis accounting, you see. So I'm just whispering into your ear, you know, so that uh, you'll be thinking about it. Well, time is running out. So, so Jan, tell us what you have in mind. Uh, you know, I can, I can make it simple. I mean, we have learned uh, in one of the previous slides so that the receipts 
other than borrowing, you know, they should actually not be included. Um, no, sorry, the proceeds from borrowings, they should not be included in the total receipts. Yeah, so think of a cash flow statement. Wait, wait, wait. What is the between receipt and revenue? Receipt means cash receipt, so what's wrong? <laughs> well, I'm just a teaching young, okay? And the reason I was whispering about urging you to compare this uh, with the cash flow statement is that this is called the operating statement. But you have things like receipts from proceeds, a repayment of borrowing, that kind of thing. Do they really belong? <laughs> I'm kind of leading you to the edge of the pool. So drink the water now. <laughs> Think about what you're going to say to your clients. Yang, do you want to unveil whatever uh, you- Yeah, want? well, why not asking the students? Um, you know, have okay. they- Let's have a, a few minutes. Any views? You have a client sitting in front of you. <laughs> Tell them what to do. <laughs> All right, maybe let's uh, go Okay, to the... I'm looking at the clock. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Look, Tim, do you want or? I mean, as, as outlined earlier, so those uh, proceeds from borrowings that you see here in the existing format, that should not be part of total receipts. Yeah? So that should actually be reported separately. Uh, and uh, where is that? Proceeds from borrowings, you see it uh, at the, you know, the last section uh, here, proceeds from borrowings. So in the proposed format, you see uh, that here. So, you know, with that kind of format, that actually really looks more like a cash flow statement that on the one side, you know, you have, let's yeah. say the operating cash flows. Yeah, so the operating cash flows the uh, financing cash flows at the bottom and the investing uh, cash flows uh, uh, separately. I mean, that would, that would essentially be the, be the idea uh, of, of that format. So right at the moment, I'm tempted to write a paper uh, to uh, tell the Ipsos board uh, the following. Uh, if you are committed to accrual accounting, then you shouldn't be telling people to do cash basis. And there's a difference between cash basis and cash flow analysis. Uh, and therefore, uh, the right-hand column here is really a hybrid. It's a hybrid of uh, cash basis statement of operations, plus the uh, a part of the cash flow statement. So this is, uh, this is not a very satisfactory uh, 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 solution because if I were a consultant, I would tell the Ministry of Finance that look, it should have a financial accounting system that's capable of producing three financial statements, balance sheet, operating statement, and, uh, and, 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 and that. And I think the, the most important thing you, I, one of the most important things I hope you learn from financial accounting is that uh, there's a difference between, between what? Well, let me give you a personal example. Uh, you are fortunately enrolled 
in a British university where the tuition is relatively low. Many American college students that take out loans or receive some aid. So financial aid is a very loaded word. You can even, you can either receive a grant, which is a gift, or you receive how much in the aggregate. Now, I'll let you guess. I imagine you probably no one will come up with such a big number. It's 1.7 trillion with a T. American college students or former college students have outstanding college loans of $1.7 trillion outstanding right now, which is larger than consumer credit debt of about $1 trillion. And right now, during the pandemic crisis, the G20 countries were just talking about debt forgiveness or delaying the payment of debt. There's a big difference between debt repayment delay versus forgiveness. Because when you borrow money, you debit cash and you credit what? You increase asset, you increase liability, right? You don't increase revenue because you have to pay back. But if your debt is forgiven, then you decrease your liability, your debit liability, and what is on the right hand side, on the credit side. Then forgiven debt becomes your revenue. Okay. And this exercise, therefore, is really intended for you to think about, besides the technical things, a smart consultant doesn't take his terms of reference, the terms of engagement as given. But we'll look at that and say that that is the definition of what I'm being asked to do, the right kind of question or not, yeah? So there's a difference between a consultant and a counselor. <laughs> a consultant, a technical consultant will give a technical answer. I have learned over time, I'm over 70 now, okay? Uh, I transitioned when I was about 50, I transitioned from a technical consultant <laughs> to a counselor. Counselor in the, it's a consultant's consultant, you know, a, a consultant will try to give the right answer, but a counselor, a senior advisor will try to ask the right kind of questions. So here the exercise asks the wrong question. It's too narrow. It put you into a mind. It put you in a mind of a choosing between operating statement and cash flow statement. I think we should step back and said, ask the Minister of Finance, what do you need? What kind of information do you need? Maybe if you have a million dollar grant, instead of uh, trying spending the money on year end financial reporting, maybe you are better off developing a better internal control system for budgetary control, for revenue forecast, for making sure that uh, there's a co less corruption or no corruption in procurement process of keeping track of your procurement uh, 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 contracts so that you won't run out of the budget appropriations before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so, so this is really the message uh, that uh, Yang Yang I would like to convey uh, to you that yes, learn all the technical things, but also apply this uh, to a particular to a particular situation. Anything to add? Uh, you are the real consultant, not me. It, it, uh, no, uh, Jim, even myself, I have learned a lesson, uh, I have to admit. Uh, so therefore, you know, when looking at the next slide, uh, I mean, I think we can skip, uh, I, I think, you know, the main point really was taken, right? <laughs> okay, oh, okay. 
Yeah, shall we go to conclusions then? Yeah, I think we have only 10 minutes. I, I just, uh, I just uh, wanted to convey uh, a few points to you. Actually, I've said that in the last few minutes already uh, that the old doesn't mean bad. The old accounting systems in a sense, why they still survive. But it's a very tempting to try something new, uh, to try something new. And I have nothing against accrual accounting because it uh, provides a long-term perspective, you know, long-term liabilities, economic resources, and, 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 and so forth. And that's all, that's all very good. Consolidated financial statements are also very good because, you know, instead of a big, thick uh, telephone book of financial statement, the overview financial statements uh, serves as purpose. It reduces the information processing costs uh, for, the, for, the, for the users, you see. So that's all very good. But the problem is that uh, you have a face trade-off. As you condense the information, you also have less information. <laughs> and therefore, you, know, you have to uh, decide what kind of trade-off. Uh, you want to make, you see. Uh, and uh, so that's really the message you want to convey. And uh, financial accounting is important, but also is a budgeting cost analysis. But the reason why organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the UN, uh, the OECD are in favor uh, of this it's because they produce financial accounting of the accrual kind of accounting, the new school of government accounting produce overviews that would be very good for reliable international comparison, you see. But my concern is that if we spend too much of all the resources in improving EAN financial statements, and don't spend enough resources for during the year kind of uh, timely financial accounting. Uh, we are not serving the needs of the uh, financial managers and the fiscal policy makers of, uh, of different countries. So that's really is, is my message. But I understand you have some career advice uh, I'm too old to give career advice now. You know, maybe you know the new opportunity, Yang. So what kind of uh, uh, advice do you have for the folks that are more of your age or younger? Jim, you mean now in terms of uh, uh, career opportunities or? Yes, yes, why not? In my next life, I would like to know. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, uh, probably that, that does not fit uh, so well now in the COVID times, uh, but uh, I mean, you know, one of the things uh, that are certainly uh, very interesting from, from a consulting perspective is that you, I mean, you are dealing with a lot of clients, you see a lot of things, uh, you really get into, let's say, the issues uh, that, uh, that the governments and entities are really facing in, in their day-to-day -day practice. and. Uh, I mean, that's, and, and you know, also working with, with different cultures. I mean, for, for myself, I mean, that is really what, you know, drives me and uh, inspires me. And uh, that, that really, you know, not just looking in just at the German situation, but also looking what is happening in Europe. Uh, I mean, that, that really broadened my perspective. And um, I mean, that is really something um, that, uh, I, I would like to convey, let's say, to the new uh, generation that, uh, I mean, government accounting, and probably you, you have seen that uh, uh, in, in the lecture, is a, a very wide field and it offers really uh, great opportunities uh, work uh, for uh, working in. So it, it's not just consulting, it's really working uh, in a public administration itself. It, it will not just be, you know, that you're just doing accounting you need to understand what is happening in, in budgeting and but also looking at the at the auditing side uh, i mean 
the court of auditors, they, you know, offering interesting uh, positions there. And, and I think, you know, that that really makes it uh, fascinating. And um, so therefore, I mean, you know, I have never really regret um, of having specialized into public sector accounting. And I, I really, you know, met with uh, many, many people around the world. And uh, the interesting thing is, you know, the issues that, that people are facing all over the world are often very similar. Yeah. So um, uh, therefore, you know, also for, for consultants, of course, learning um, from different uh, uh, clients and but uh, in the end, often the, the problems that uh, people are facing are often similar. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, Professor Chen and, and yes, for, for, the, for this introduction to public sector accounting. I think we traveled um, across, across the world and we crossed the pond from the US to the UK, then more to, to perhaps the European uh, EPSAS, European Public Sector Accounting Standards. And, and also we went from more um, the balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow, uh, I mean, their, their respective parts in, in the in public sector as well as the budget and the, and the fund accounting. So thank you very much for this uh, perspective on public sector. I hope it inspired some of the students. We will discuss it later, but thank you very much for your time in introducing us to public sector accounting.